Rockets are some of the most advanced and highly engineered machines ever built by humans. With the explosive power of millions of tons of TNT and the capacity to propel a space capsule up to speeds of thousands of kilometers per hour, they've allowed us to reach the greatest achievements in human history, including putting a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. In this video, I will explain simply how a rocket engine works, why there are a variety of rocket fuel types, and what the advantages and disadvantages of each are, with a tad of futurism thrown in. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to 26 Dimensions if you're interested in space exploration and never want to miss our weekly engineering and astronautics videos. If you learned something from this video or find it entertaining, please consider liking it so other people can watch it too. Advancements in space technology have led to the use of many different fuel sources as propellants for rockets climbing towards outer space. Before we start looking into several space propulsion methods, we need to look at how rockets get off the surface of the Earth in the first place. Any rocket accelerating through space or off the Earth applies Newton's third law, which states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. In the combustion chamber, the force of hot gas expanding and then directing out through the jet is what gives the rocket the required thrust to overcome the Earth's gravitational pull. Likewise, this is how a rocket travels in outer space. It does not require pushing against anything physical, it is the force created by the expulsion of hot gas that drives the rocket in the opposing direction. That said, every rocket uses different propulsion methods to effectively do the same thing. We are most familiar with chemical propulsion. There are many arrangements of fuels and oxidizers, but let's take the example of the famous Saturn V rocket to discuss further. The Saturn V in the first stage burns a combination of an advanced mix of kerosene and liquid oxygen. Both of these liquids are stored in separate tanks, injected by turbo pumps into a combustion chamber where they are ignited. The expansion of that gas is forced out through the engine bell, reducing the pressure of the exhaust gases to atmospheric pressure, to provide thrust. Another kind of chemical reaction uses cryogenics, which involve the storage of fuel and oxidizers at extremely cold temperatures. The Saturn V's upper stages use liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen at freezing temperatures, kept in separate tanks, and again inserted via turbo pumps to be ignited in the ignition cavity to push the rocket in its later stages of velocity gain. Yet another propulsion method uses hypergolic reactions. This involves fuel and oxidizer that ignite on interaction and do not require a combustion source, which provides great results for spaceflight because there are fewer moving parts, therefore making the propulsion system less prone to problems. All that is required is to open a valve to combine the two reagents so that they ignite and propel the rocket forward. This is the same type of propulsion that the Apollo engine used. Lastly, some rockets also use solid fuel. This method has the fuel and oxidizer stored in a powdered form in a single body. This mixture is ignited to start a reaction and produce thrust. If we step aside from all the chemical reactions, we have the electric or ion propulsion system. This is what was used by the Dawn mission to first get to its destination Vesta and then to Ceres. Inside the ion engine, electrons are removed from atoms causing the ions to charge up. The ions are accelerated in an electric field before being fired out the back of the engine, delivering the push to the rocket. Finally, there's nuclear propulsion. In this, rockets produce the push by using cryogenic hydrogen to cool off the reactor core, in turn expanding and heating the gas. The expanding gas is targeted via the jet to produce the required thrust. We see missions leaving the Earth riding on chemically propelled rockets because a chemical propulsion is the only one powerful enough to overcome the gravitational pull of the Earth. However, this is not the best reaction. Once the payload is in space and on its way to a distant planet, a chemical reaction might not be the best way to get it there. We use specific impulse to determine how good a rocket's propulsion actually is. This is defined as the magnitude of an engine's effectiveness, taking into account the altering mass as it burns through its fuel. Engines that provide propulsion by chemical reactions have a lower specific impulse, and it is extremely difficult to make it any better. We cannot create a stronger reaction using the same chemicals that provided the initial thrust. You can use more fuel and build bigger rockets, but you can only make them so much more efficient. This is where ion and nuclear propulsion have an advantage. They have a weaker thrust, but a higher specific impulse, meaning they need less fuel to create a comparable change to the velocity of the rocket. You need a lot less fuel in these types of engines for the same acceleration. 
So, while neither of them is powerful enough to get a rocket into orbit, these are ideal for long-duration deep space missions. There are trade-offs to all of these methods of propulsion, but because we've been using chemical propulsion almost exclusively since the 1950s, this is what we will most likely continue to see in spaceflight for the near future. I hope this video gave you a concise enough explanation of the different kinds of rocket fuels and why we use them. If you're interested in seeing more videos about rocketry and space travel, please subscribe to our channel. You'll want to stick around because we have an amazing video about North Korea's failed satellite launch attempts coming soon. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.